So today we want to talk about uh, mechanism design with constraints, with budget constraints. Okay, and in the previous class we uh, talked about VCG mechanism where the idea was that we want to define based on the preferences of the other uh, based on the preferences of the players uh, we want to come up with a function f that maps their uh, preferences slash cost or value functions to uh, to outcome and some payment pi that maps the outcome or other preferences and cost to payments payment of player i okay so that's what we did in the last two classes so in the case of auctions uh, the there was a value for the object right and you wanted to the mechanism designer wanted to come up with a function f that maps the preferences or the values of the players to who wins the auction and then the payment what should the payment of the person who won the auction should be and what should the payment of people who did not win the auction uh, who not, who did not win the auction what should their payoffs be uh, or what they what should their payment be okay so that was also part of the auction designers uh, action but in all cases pi is equal to 0 for all players who didn't win the auction okay so it's kind of trivial in that sense but uh, remember that it's also part of the strategic variable for the mechanism designer now today we want to talk about cases where ethical concerns where ethical concerns and moral concerns or legal concerns uh, dictate that there shouldn't be any payment okay so pi should be equal to zero or pi should be less than some amount okay so let's look at an example let's say we want students we want to match students to universities okay so the mechanism designer will ask for preferences from every student and then it has to come up with the outcome whereas each student has to be matched to the university okay so one idea that mechanism designer let's say you were hired to do that job and you say that you know what let's ask each student how much he is willing he or she is willing to pay to come to this university okay and whoever pays the highest gets to gets a position within this university okay so you you can obviously think about it uh, and you, you, you know that this seems to be morally wrong. There's, some, there's something morally wrong about this mechanism. It doesn't seem right. Um, so, so you don't want to ask for any payment. Okay? So PI has to be forced to be equal to zero, even though students might be willing to pay for it. Okay? And of course, there are universities who will allow the donors to have their family members as students in their universities. Okay, this is something that all of us know and we, we kind of know about it. But we also know that it sounds unethical or it sounds illegal or it sounds, there seems to be some problem with this notion of taking a payment and then giving admission to someone else. Uh, so that's, that's not good, okay? So that's one example. The other example is uh, uh, kidney exchange. So in US, it is illegal for you to pay someone. Let's say you want a kidney it's illegal for you to pay someone to get a kidney okay so what typically happens is well you come with a friend or with a relative who's willing to donate his or her kidney to you okay but if it is not matching then now you have to get matched to another patient and donor pair so that you can do a swap okay so the other person's the other patient's donor can give you kidney and your donor can give the other patient kidney Okay, so again, there is no exchange of money in this case. Okay, so PI is necessarily forced to be equal to zero. Now, third type of auction is the Google AdWords, wherein uh, what Google will ask you, let's say you start a company and you want to advertise a product, let's say you open a hotel and you want to advertise your hotel on Google, uh, 
what Google will ask you is how much are you willing to pay for your advertisement? So that's number one. And number two, in one day, how much, what is your budget? Okay. So you have some sort of budget. So besides, so in your preferences, you have two, you have two pulls. So one is your value. How much is each advertisement value? How, how do you value each advertisement on Google's website? So that's one thing. But the second thing is, what's your budget? So in one day, if thousands of people search for your hotel and they click on your hotel link, uh, you will probably bankrupt you within a day. Okay? So you don't want that to happen. So you give a budget constraint that, well, you know what? I can pay $1 for every click. But in one day, I will pay you at most $15 or $20 or something. Okay? So you know that you will not get bankrupted by the end of the day by people randomly clicking your hotel. Okay, so that's so there. In that case, uh, the payment is restricted by the amount of budget you have mentioned. Okay, so payment cannot be more than the budget. So let's first talk about the case where PI is necessarily it, it has to be equal to zero. Okay, so PI is forced to be equal to zero. because of ethical, legal, moral, whatever concerns one might have. Uh, by the way, this, this case where PI should be equal to zero also happens in election where you vote for a candidate. So that's, uh, but the mechanism designer decides how, depending upon the votes, who should be chosen as the candidate. Okay? So in that case, there is no payment. The candidate cannot pay to the designer in order to get uh, elected into whatever seat he, is, uh, he or she is uh, contesting upon. Okay, so that's also false within this, uh, within this uh, framework. Okay, so we'll study the house allocation problem. Okay, so that's the first problem we want to study. And the setting is as follows. We have N agents. Each of them have have a house and each has a house and E and N a strict preference order over the houses, over n houses. Okay? So all of us in the room, we have a house and we have a strict preference over the houses of all of us. Okay? So I might prefer your house, you might prefer his house, his, he might prefer somebody else's house and so on. Okay, so, so each agent has a strict preference order for n houses. So if look at agent one, agent one might prefer J1 strictly to J2, strictly to J3 and so on. So I'm going to use the same index for both the agent and the house that the agent is currently living in. Okay, so similarly, agent two will say, well, I prefer J2 over J4 over J1 over whatever. Okay, so each of the agents have a preference order of this type. And the idea is to come up with a allocation so that every agent is happy. Okay, that's the idea. So how to allocate? houses to make everyone happier okay I mean of course happier is not a mathematical uh, thing but you kind of know what I'm talking about right everyone gets the most preferred house What do you think should uh, 
how do you think you should come up let's say you want to come up with an algorithm so of course each agent has to report this preference order right so you might think that you know what I let's say you are agent one and you say you know what I prefer J1's house over J2's house but how about I say you know I reveal that I prefer J2's house over J1 house okay so you can you can in order to be more strategic or you, you might think that you know what if the allocation algorithm is not well designed you might have a preference to lie about which house you find better than the other okay so that you get what you want so we want to avoid that situation we want to avoid situation where agents so we want to design an allocation scheme so that there is no incentive for any agent to lie about its preferences so let's define some things so we say that S is a blocking coalition if they can trade among themselves. And what do I mean by that? So here is the idea. One says he prefers two's house more than one's house. Two says he prefers one house more than two's house. So they can form a blocking coalition and just swap their house. Okay? So that's a blocking coalition. So S equals one comma two. They don't need to participate in this entire process. Okay, they can form their own little coalition and then they can swap their houses and they are both happy. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, that's what the algorithm, allocation algorithm will do. So you're saying if one prefers his own house over everybody else's house, that's what the algorithm would do, the allocation algorithm. Okay. And then, so that's one, and the two is rest of them are called code. Okay, so you have you have the set of agents n. Okay, so one to n, you have a blocking coalition, and rest of them would be called a code. So n, so one to n minus s would be called a code. So the theorem is, uh, le actually let's talk about the allocation algorithm. So it's called top trading cycle algorithm. Top trading cycle algorithm. So what does this algorithm do? Let's first create a graph. Let's create a graph. So this is one, two, three. Okay. So one prefers his own house. So I have to actually, I, do, do I have color chalks here? No, I don't have colored chalks here. Okay. So I need to color these edges. Uh, so one prefers his own house. That's, that's one's first preference. Then it prefers house number two or second agent's house. That's his second preference. And then prefers third agent's house. 
Okay, so I'm using the number of lines to denote different colors. So what's the ranking? Okay, same thing. Two might prefer three's house. Uh, that's that's first choice, and then second choice would be one's house, and the third choice would be its own house. Okay, and so on. Three will also have some choices. So this is a colored graph, okay, color directed edge. I should have gotten color chalks. Okay, so at step one, so what do you do in this to top trading cycle algorithm? So first thing you do is create a colored, so this is a colored directed edges including self loops. So in step one, so step zero is to create a graph. Step one, fine. directed cycles and self loops of color one. So that's the top preference color, uh, so single lines there. Swap and delete those nodes and edges. Uh, nodes and directed edges. Okay, so what's a directed cycle? Uh, is everyone familiar with directed cycles? No? Okay, let's uh, Let's see what a cycle is. So I create a graph. One, two, three. And let's look at color one. Okay, so let's look at the first color. So I have one is self loop. Two wants three. And let's say three wants Three wants one. That's the first preference of three. Okay, so a directed cycle in general, let's say you have more graphs. I, I want to, I, if I want to draw directed, directed cycle, let, I, I probably should have a larger graph for directed cycle. So one, two, three, four, Okay, so a directed cycle would be such that you go from 1 to 4, 4 to 2, 2 to 5, 5 to 3, and then 3 to 2. Okay, so this is a directed cycle. Well, oh no, this is not a cycle. It has to go to 1 for the cycle to be complete. Is this a cycle? Yes, it looks like a cycle. Yeah. So this is a cycle. So you go from one to four, four to two. These are all directed edges. So you can't go from four to one. But you can go from one to four because the edge is in that direction. So you go from one to four, four to two, two to five, five to three, and three to one. Okay, so this is a cycle. This is a directed cycle. So what you have to do is find directed cycles and self loops of color one. Okay, so that's the first step that you have to do. Then what you have to do is swap. So what's going to happen is one will occupy four's house, four will occupy two's house, two will occupy fifth, uh, agent five's house, and five will occupy agent three's house, and three will occupy agent one's house. Okay, so this entire swapping will be done instantly, and then we'll delete all these nodes 
from the graph itself. Okay, so any directed edges that is coming into the node or going out of the node, those will also get deleted. Now I am left with agent six, seven, nine, ten, and let's say eight, and you have the second color. Okay, so in step two, you know, find directed cycle self loops of color two, and then swap and delete those nodes and directed edges. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, uh, let's try to find a directed cycle uh, of color two. Well, this looks like a directed cycle of color two, so we'll do the same thing, we'll swap all these agents will swap among them, swap their houses immediately, and then we'll delete those nodes and directed edges from the from the graph, and we'll continue, okay, until everyone is matched, everyone's house has been reallocated. Do you have a question? What if those things were like maybe six preferred, seven preferred their first choice? Is that not considered here then? Six preferred? Say six prefers seven's house as their first choice, not their second. Uh, oh, I see. Yes, because not all first choices will be allocated in the first instant itself. What do they write about? So the book says delete all edges colored one. So if six and seven weren't matched, six and seven had a single directed edge, the book says just remove these color ones, okay? Because color ones are all, have all been swapped. Someone's first preference node was deleted. Mm -hmm. Its second preference would be its first preference. Its first node is not made again anymore. Yeah, but in this case, you know, it's just that seven wasn't allocated any house, so seven will remain in his house. So even though six prefers seven. So say like six prefers one, but it wasn't allocated at the beginning. Okay. But one is no more in the game. One more, yeah. Well, yes, that is true. So that is what this algorithm is doing. But his point is, let's say six preferred seven, but they weren't allocated house in the first step of the game. Because for six to be allocated seventh house, seven has to be allocated someone else's house in the first so, preference yeah, itself. I so I mean like the second color would be the first color now. So all these two okay. sides. Well, okay. Well, the book says that you have to delete all the color one edges. Okay, so when you say delete those nodes and directed edges and color one edges, you know, I am not very comfortable with that. I, even though the book writes it and they prove a few theorem about it. I don't quite know whether this is correct or this is wrong. But, well, okay, so this is what, yeah. Uh, maybe after deleting all the cycles in the first iteration, yeah. you convert all the remaining uh, color one edge to color two edge. Yeah, that's, then it the same problem. right, right. Then it becomes the same problem, but uh, that's, not, that's not what the book suggests. Six, nine, ten, and eight. Yeah. So you can't have two. So you can't have preferences. Okay. But then six and seven will have 
कलर थ्री कनेक्शन राइट या देन इट्स नॉट अ साइकिल या करेक्ट सो दे विल दे विल स्वैप अमंग देम सेल्फ या तो oh because so you have to look at the entire graph okay so so what you want is someone else to occupy seventh house okay in the second step step 2 but we are not able to find someone who will occupy seventh house for 7 to go into 9000 9 to go into someone else's house so all this swapping has to be done immediately there is no storage <laughs> in this city okay okay so uh, so that's what you do and then you delete all color two edges and so on okay so that's the algorithm given in the book i don't quite know why all the color one edges should be removed that's what the book says so let's assume that that is the case so at every point of time you're looking at a smaller and smaller graph eventually it's going to converge yes yeah for the first part of the so it's the same idea of the order of the mm -hmm. what if your first preference is in the game but he is still living in his house that's the problem so my point is Let's say between six and seven, there is a single color one edge. Okay, but because seven could not move into someone else's house, six cannot move into seven. What the algorithm says? Well, you know what? Stage one, step one is over. Just remove this edge completely. Okay, it's not needed. This edge is not needed. That's what the algorithm is saying. okay and this seems to have uh, uh and this has the property that it is a dominant strategy incentive compatible so this so if you if you say this is the algorithm that i'm going to use for reallocation then the theorem is TTC algorithm is dominant strategy incentive compatible okay uh, some people also call it strict strategy proof Okay, so it's weakly dominant. So for everyone, it's weakly dominant to reveal its true preference order. Okay, so that's incentive compatible. So being truthful is incentive is 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 the weakly dominant strategy in this particular case. Okay, and it's also known as strategy proof. So that's there's no there's no point of using some other strategy. That's what strategy proof means. Okay, being truthful is the best strategy. and the uh, other thing is ttc algorithm will find the find an allocation in the core ttc will find an allocation of the core so of course some people will form a blocking coalition they will trade among themselves and the rest of them are core and ttc will find an allocation for the core as well any question about this algorithm of course i wasn't able to answer the question about why color one edges should be removed but we'll see no it can be multiple people yeah 
Okay. Okay, so blocking coalition can have a large size. Uh, so, what is the problem in this particular algorithm? Let's say you want to exchange kidneys. Okay, so you can use this algorithm for for figuring out. Let's look at a specific cycle. So six represent a donor. A patient donor pair, 9 represents a patient donor pair and each of these edges represent that the patient, so donor 6 is compatible with patient 9, patient 9, sorry, donor 9 is compatible with patient 10, donor 10 is compatible with patient 8, donor 8 is compatible with patient 6, okay, yeah. Correct, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. But if there is a non cycle, the number of edges is less than zero. So if we if we have a set of n nodes, n edges, mm -hmm. so equal number of nodes and edges remain. Mm -hmm. So there can't be a non loop. Because if Yeah, well yeah, if there is a loop then it will get caught up in the step one itself. Any directed cycle so will I'm be saying if we remove all the loops, there will be a either Single nodes with whose first preference is not in the graph, or there are loops. There can't be a case where there is an open loop. Oh, I see what you are saying. Because in that case, the number of nodes and number of edges won't be equal. But we are using right. nodes and edges whenever we remove that cycle. Right, right, right. That's true. Okay. It, has everyone understood what his point is? Well, if since everyone has only one unique top reference, there are n nodes and n edges. Now I remove a cycle, which means I have removed, say, d plus one nodes and d edges. No, d nodes and d edges. D nodes and d edges. Yeah, d nodes and d edges, right. So now I have n minus d nodes and n minus d edges. So what's the, so what's happening? If there is an open loop, yes, yes, that's right. So in an open loop, there is no, yeah. So there will be d plus one nodes and d edges. So we have a problem. We can't swap. But why? Why do we have to delete those edges? Why can't we consider? Why can't we change all color one edges to color two edges? And then redo the step two. I'm saying there won't be any open loops remaining. Okay, well. Yeah. Are gone. yeah. For example, if you have a star, there is a central node, and there are nodes around it, all have the first preference at the central node. Okay. And the central node also has some preference. Right. So Let's. So if we, if we remove the cycle, we remove those two nodes, we have three nodes, we have just single nodes. Oh, I see, so okay. Correct. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe maybe if we implement this algorithm, we'll see some behavior of that sort, uh, which will make sure that uh, there are no color one edges left, which is pointing to a specific node. Okay, so it might just be pointing to a empty node or whatever. There's no node whatsoever, okay, because we have removed that node. And so you can remove all color one edges without any problem. Okay, I, I buy that argument. That that might be true. Okay. Okay, but does the, does, this does not explain why we should, why the book would say remove the edges. If there's no node connecting this edge, then it doesn't have any meaning. Yeah, then it doesn't have any meaning. Right, right, right. Why would it say that delete all color one edges? Correct. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was a good discussion, but this is still an 
uh, well, I, I, I understand the argument. The idea is that maybe there is the, all the color one edges is pointing in void, okay? Pointing at infinity or something. Uh, and so there's no point of those colored edges and so you can re delete them. But the question is why should we delete them? I mean, they probably are already deleted by the very nature of the fact that it's not pointing to a specific node. So anyways, we'll, we'll think about it later. Okay, but now here is, here is uh, uh, the problem uh, with TTC algorithm. Uh, and what I was discussing was there is a donor. So donor six is compatible with patient nine and so on. So we have the cycle, which means that we now have to have multiple operations being conducted at the same time. Okay, why is that? So let's say donor six donated its kidney to patient nine, okay? And then we want donor nine to donate its kidney to patient 10. So there is a problem. Now, since, since this donor donated first, now donor nine doesn't have an incentive to participate in this program, right? So if you do it sequentially, if you conduct operations sequentially, then some of the donors might retract their offer, okay, because their patient is already treated. So there is a problem, okay? So long cycles of this type is a problem. So long cycles are a problem in kidney exchange. So what do we, what, do, what should we try to do? Well, we should try to come up with an, but here is another, another issue with the uh, kidney exchange. You see, patient doesn't have a strict ordering. Remember, in this case, there was supposed to be a strict ordering among houses. In this case, patient six doesn't have a strict ordering of which donor's kidney he would accept, okay? It's all decided by biology. It's not your feeling that, you know, I have a strict preference over someone's kidney over somebody else's kidney, okay? As long as it matches, the blood group matches, the tissue matches, it's fine, okay? There's no strict ordering. So we are essentially looking at a slightly different problem because in this case, TTC algorithm, we assume the strict preference relationship, whereas now in kidney exchange, we don't have strict preference, but at the same time, we don't want long cycles. Okay, we don't want long cycles to come out of algorithm. So that's the, so we need to come up with something else, some other algorithm. Where the idea is, you have graph one, two, three, four, five. Let's say this is uh, this relationship. Uh, what it says is, it's a it's a bidirectional graph. So that's why I'm not uh, drawn the direction direction part. So it's a bidirectional graph, which means that patient one's kidney is compatible with donor two, and patient two's kidney is compatible with donor one's kidney. Okay, and so on. So how should we go about matching the kidneys in this case? Okay, so the idea is find pairwise pairwise match. Okay, why pairwise? Because you can conduct an operation, you know, four operations in the same room for each of these pairs, okay? But if you have a long cycle of this type, then you want, I don't know, eight people being operated at the same time in the same room, okay, at the same location, at the same time. So that's kind of a problem. 
So the idea for kidney matching problem, kidney exchange problem is to find a pairwise match instead of finding cycles and matching according to cycles, which is what you would otherwise do in this housing problem. And there is an, and the algorithm is fairly easy. You find maximum cardinality matching. which is the same as find maximum cardinality matching okay so you so in this particular case well there are only five people so maybe i should add a sixth one so you want to make sure that every pair is matched. So you will probably match one to three. And then you will match two to four. And five to six. Okay, and everyone is matched. Everyone is happy. They get operated. They go home. They enjoy life. Okay. Now you can add a little bit more to it. You can say that, well, you know, if we cannot match everyone, then how should we figure out? There may be multiple maximum cardinality matching, okay? Maximum cardinality matching means you should have maximum number of edges. So you should match maximum number of patients, okay? So the question is, well, you could have five different ways of matching people. In one case, somebody will get a kidney. In other matches, somebody, that person may not get the kidney. So how should you how should you match them? Well, you assign priority to every individual, depending upon how long they have been on the wait list for a kidney. Okay, so that's a side remark. You can come up with those kidney exchange algorithms. I mean, there are those algorithms and satisfies good properties and so on. So, so this is perhaps the most important application of mechanism design uh, in, uh, in real life. Okay, so it's uh, fairly uh, fairly useful, at least in US, there is now a kidney exchange that does this matching for all the patients across United States and then figures out which donor should donate to which patient and, uh, and it's quite successful. Uh, and of course, directly has an impact on people who were otherwise fairly sad in the older days because they couldn't find a match for their kidney. Okay, <clears throat> any question about this? No? So the second problem that I want to talk about is table matching, which is different from housing problem, slightly different. Stable matching. So the idea is we have M, which is the set of men, W, set of women. For the time being, just assume that the set of men is equal to the, well, the number of elements in men is same as the number of elements in women. So that way you can have a perfect match. And we say, and let's say mu is a matching between m and w, which means that mu is a function from m to w, or rather I should write it as mu equals mu1 comma mu2, where mu1 
is a matching from m to w and mu2 is a matching from w to m and mu2 equals mu1 inverse. So here is m1, m2, m3, w1, w2, w3. This is a matching. So in short, we will just write mu, mu as a function from m to w as well as w to m. So we'll sort of uh, abuse the notation a little bit and just say that mu of m is the woman that men is matched to and mu of w will be the man she is matched to. Okay, so that's a matching. Now, in this case, the preference relationship is two-sided, okay? So each man has a strict preference order among women. Each woman has a strict preference order among men, okay? So there is a strict preference order, so that's important. So we need to come up with a notion of stable matching. What's a stable matching? Well, we come up with a match, but then there is no, so no one is in, once we have decided what the match should be, no one has an incentive to break ties, okay, like this, and then, and then uh, uh, create new ties, uh, which is better than the previous one. So, so that's what a stable match, what an unstable matching would be like. So there are divorces in unstable matching, okay, and we don't want any divorce, so we want to come up with a matching algorithm so that. It's a stable match in some sense. So let's define unstable match. So mu is unstable if there exists m, m prime in m w, w prime in w such that mu m equals w to mu m prime equals w prime. So the matching matches man m to women w uh, man M prime to women W prime. And then the third is W prime strictly prefers, no, M strictly prefers W prime over W and M is strictly preferred over M prime for the women W prime. Okay, so man M wants W prime. So man M prefers W prime over W and women W prime prefers M over M prime. Okay, so in this case, you say that M W prime is blocking, blocking pair. Okay, so they are blocking this uh, unstable match. And if there are no blocking pairs, then it's a stable match. So no blocking pair implies stable match. No one has an incentive to deviate from the match. <coughs> OK, so this is useful. Uh, for, of course, marriages, for sure. If uh, 
everyone could figure out what their strict preference order is among all the women in this planet and all women are able to figure out the strict preference matching uh, strict preference among all the men you can perhaps come up with a matching so that there is no divorce whatsoever on this planet okay you can definitely do that okay but there are other applications too well uh, you want doctors to assign to hospitals and hospitals should be accepting doctors right so each doctor has a preference order it wants to go to hospital 1 uh, hospital 1 is better than hospital 2 is better than hospital 3 same thing for doctor number 2 it will have some preference each hospital will also have a preference over doctor they want a person of this caliber over a person with some other caliber or with person with certain speciality and so on okay so it's useful for uh, matching doctors to hospitals matching students to universities except that in this case it's a different from students and university case because each university can accept multiple students but each student will have can only go to one university okay so that's a slightly different problem but let's say there was one student and one university one student gets matched to one university only then you can probably use this framework to think about that kind of problem so the idea is to come up with an algorithm that computes a stable match so so existence of stable match it comes from tarski fixed point theorem and that's a fixed point theorem over lattices for those of you who might have taken abstract algebra would have, would probably be familiar with the term lattices but those of you who are not it's not important well it's important but we won't study it in this class so that gives you the existence of stable match so in some sense an equilibrium exists in this particular game and the algorithm that finds a stable match is known as deferred acceptance algorithm what do you think this algorithm should look like okay i'm sure you have been in marriage market or something or you have seen people marrying each other right so what do you think the the way to get a stable matching be like what step 1 any thoughts <laughs> you know this algorithm might just change your life who knows <laughs> okay so step 1 is part a all men uh propose to their first choice okay so in step 1 there are two stages in the first stage each man each person is going to propose to their first choice and then part b is any woman receiving two plus proposals would reject would reject everyone else except the best proposal will would accept the best proposal it's not as romantic as you think okay <laughs> okay so any woman receiving two plus proposal would accept the best proposal and reject everyone else okay so now each man either is uh matched to a specific to one woman and each well each man is matched to a specific woman right but and the woman and some women are matched to a specific man 
But there are some men who are not matched to any woman. There are women who are left out. Okay, so in the first case, some matching is done, but there are still many men and many women waiting to be matched. So then comes step two. In this case, all rejected men in step one propose to their top choice among women who are unmatched. and who didn't reject them. Oh, actually, it's women who didn't reject them. So they could be matched. Who didn't okay. So what has happened now? Well, in, in, in step 1b, there would be some women who would receive 2 plus proposal and they will choose the best proposal and reject everyone else. Now all those rejected men would propose to their top choice. Okay, So they, they have a preference order and the first person in that preference order might have rejected their proposal. So they would propose to the next person in their preference order who did not reject them. So that's fine. That's okay. What it means is many women who were matched in step 1b would also receive some proposals, right? So what should they do? Okay, they are still they are matched to a person, right? In this case they are each those women were matched to at least one person. So what are they going to do? Well, Woman receiving two plus proposal including the one in step one B. Okay. So some of these women will receive a proposal in step two A and they also have matched with some person in step 1b, so they will look at all these proposals that she has and pick the best one. Okay, and this will go on. Okay, so this is known as dating in our day-to-day -day activities. Okay, so this is what is happening. You propose, so men propose to their first choice, then women receiving two proposals will accept the best proposal. Then rejected men will propose to their top choice, the second best choice. Women receiving two plus proposal, including the ones that she was matched to in step 1b, she will look at all those proposals and pick the best one and so on. Okay, this process will go on and it will terminate in n square step. So this is step 1, 2, so it will go all the way to step n square at most and it will give you a stable match okay so that's the stable match in the end so that's really good yeah n is the cardinality of cardinality of the set of men and women So that's the main theorem. Deferred Acceptance Algorithm, DAA. Results in <coughs> stable matching, it yields Yields stable 
match. So that's number one. Now you can reverse the process. So you can do, you can say that well, all women will propose to their first choice among men, and any man receiving two plus proposals would accept the best proposal, and so on. Okay, so you can reverse this process. In which case, also DAA will yield a stable match, but it's not the same as this stable match. Okay, so it will reveal a different, it will yield a different stable match. Okay, and both of them will be stable match. So let me call it DAA with men proposing, well, DAA men, in which case men proposes to women. And so DAA men, so DAA in general, no matter whether it's a, it's a DAA man or DAA woman, it will still yield a stable match. That's fine. And then I need to introduce another definition for the next theorem. So let me introduce it here. You know, Uber, Uber matching a passenger to a rider is also a matching algorithm. Okay, so yeah. In this algorithm, is there a strict preference? For they also have a strict preference. Okay, so that's interesting. Like if you switch the order of proposals first, then you get a different answer. Although there's a strict preference. That's right. That's right. You get a different match. Yeah. So we want to define male optimal. So whatever I'm going to say uh, now onwards, you can come up with the appropriate version when you are talking about DAA female. So what is a male optimal match? So mu from M to W is male optimal. Optimal if there does not exist any new from M to W, so another match new M to W, so that new is stable, new M, we have either new M is strictly preferred for all M to mu M, okay, so in the new match, so new is a stable match, so there is no stable match where each man prefers the other, the woman that is uh, matched in this new, in this uh, stable match new for all M or new M equals to mu M for all M in, for all M not equal to M prime and new M prime strictly prefers, strictly prefers the new match as compared to the old match. So it's a male optimal, okay? There is no other stable match which will yield better uh, match for all possible, for all the males in this particular system. So it turns out that DAA men yields male optimal, optimal match. And also uh, DAA men is DSIC, dominant strategy incentive compatible for men. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so what's the significance here? Well, if men propose to women, you will yield, the, this algorithm will yield a stable match and this stable match is going to be male optimal match, okay? What is a male optimal match? Well, there is no other stable match 
in which at least one male will be better off. Okay, so there is no other stable match like that. So, so, so that's a male optimal match. More importantly, males in this particular algorithm, males will not have an incentive to lie. Okay, they will be truthful about their preference order. However, it's not DSIC for women. Okay, now if women propose to men, to men, in that case, it will be DSIC for women, but not for men. Okay, so that's the property of this particular stable matching uh, algorithm, deferred acceptance algorithm. Any any question about this stable matching? No. So these are uh, two algorithms where the mechanism designer comes up with a function f which matches the preference to certain outcome, but there is no payment. Okay, pi is strictly equal to zero in all these cases, and more importantly, we are still able to guarantee incentive compatibility. Okay, but sometimes in dominant strategy for certain class of problems, okay? So that's, uh, that's really the, uh, a, a very strong property for this class of uh, problems. Now, there are other issues that are being talked about in the literature. So that's the research front, which is uh, you want to do this stable match but now what you have is a, is a spouse, so a pair of doctors, they are husband and wife pair, okay, and they want to go to the same hospital. How do you match them? Okay, so each hus husband has a preference order, wife has a preference order, how do you match them? Okay, so that's an issue that people are looking at. So the other one is, we talked about the kidney exchange problem. Now imagine this scenario where you have two hospitals and they have patients, so this hospital has a patient donor pair, this hospital has another patient donor pair. Okay, multiple patient donor pairs and multiple patient donor pairs. The problem is, each hospital is supposed to report the fact that it has patient donor pair to a central kidney exchange. Um, yeah, kidney exchange, that's what the, the exchange is called. Now the hospital don't have an incentive, let's say it has uh, two patient donor pairs that are compatible among each other, okay? So it can just do a swap within the hospital and not have to report it to the kidney exchange, okay? But it leads to a suboptimal outcome because maybe this donor, this patient donor pair could be matched to someone else in the other hospital and that other donor could be matched to the patient in this hospital, okay? So it leads to some sort of suboptimal outcome and people are coming up with incentive schemes for hospitals to report truthfully the entire set of patient donor pairs, okay? And this is a very important problem because you see it's not incentive compatible for the hospitals to reveal the true information about their patient donor pairs, okay? So you want to come up with a mechanism that is incentive compatible even for hospitals to participate. So that's an important problem and uh, the other thing that we didn't talk about is clinching auction and clinching auction is where you have budget constraint okay so pi is positive but you have budget constraint so uh, remember in the vcg auction pi was anything okay it can be any large number okay you you don't control that number but if you have a case for instance in the google adword case you have a budget constraint you don't want to pay more than 15 dollars per day to google how do you do that? Well, the way you will run the algorithm is you will start reducing the price. You will keep a start with the highest price and then you'll re reduce the price. And every time the price goes below certain level, somebody will clinch an item, okay? So, well, let me, let me very briefly tell you what the, what the algorithm is. That's also a dominant strategy incentive compatible. So it's a very important class. So the idea is PI is greater than zero, but budget 
there is a budget B i. So, okay, there is no, there are, there are m items that are identical. You have P i or rather V i value to player i. So, if player i consumes one item, its value is V i and then B i which is the budget of player i. Okay. So, obviously, if, if m multiplied by V i is less than equal to B i, then you will give, the person will give all m items to player 1, uh, sorry, player i and be done with this option. But if this is not true, then somehow you have to come up with the price. Somehow you want to assign the object, the items to players who value it the most. So you, what you do is you start with a high price, okay, and you reduce the price. So the person with the highest value will clinch the item at that particular price. So the number of items will go to m minus 1. And let's say player 1 clinch the item. Player 1 clinched the item. Then the new game, in the new game, you will have vi remains the same. But b1, player 1's budget is b1 minus p because at price p, he has clinched the item. Okay, so this is budget of player 1. But for other players, the budget is going to be bi itself. Okay, So for pi, where i is not equal to 1, the budget is going to be bi because the other players have not cleansed the item yet. Okay, And you will keep running this auction in this fashion and that seems to be a dominant strategy incentive compatible which means no player has an incentive to lie about its value. This budget is supposed to be public knowledge. So this is public knowledge. So everyone knows it, everyone knows that, everyone else knows it, and so on. Okay. So no player has an incentive to lie if you run a clinching auction. And this clinching auction is run by Google for its uh, AdWords uh, auction. So, so it's kind of useful to know uh, this class of uh, problems. So this is the real mechanism with uh, budget constraint. This one is where budget is equal to zero because there is some moral, ethical, or legal issue with having a budget in these class of problems. So that's all I have for today. Uh, next time we are going to talk about uh, approximately optimal mechanisms where the idea is that it's not necessary to have the auction be completely optimal, the best possible auction that you can have, because it might have a lot of computational effort. It might require a lot of computational effort to run that auction. So what you want to do is come up with some very clever approximation techniques so that you can run an auction in real time, uh, and it yields an approximately optimal outcome. So we'll talk about price of anarchy and things of that nature in the next class. Okay, thank you guys.